Okay, so it's, uh, it's a couple of minutes past two now, so should we get started? Uh, thank you everyone for joining this um, live demonstration of EBSD today. Um, we will be presenting this as part of the EBSD users group here at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, today's presenters will be myself, Alec Davis, uh, Jack Donahue, who's on the APRIO microscope that we'll be using today, and uh, Ali Galinia will be uh, assisting us as well. Um, um, yeah, just for the few of you that have joined, just to reiterate, um, please do mute your microphones during the presentation and do bear in mind that this video, uh, this session is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear in the video, please do uh, turn off your cameras. So just a bit about us. Um, we're a group of uh, academics, postdoctoral researchers and experimental officers that are working together to try and put forward uh, some good um, EBSD uh, demonstrations and live presentations. Last year, we put on uh, quite a few of them um, with uh, Ali leading the charge there. Thank you very much for that, Ali. Um, you can get details of everything that's happening with this group at uh, the website microscopy.manchester.ac.uk forward slash EBSD. Um, on this site, we have the up and coming EBSD users meeting. So this one is us today, the 30th of September. Just going forward, we're planning on doing another one of these demonstrations with a, a bit more of the more technical detail. But also on this website is uh, some information about how you can join the EBSD users group. We've got some information about um, some software and it uh, documents all the past meetings that we've had and all the past presentations. Um, we also have a Slack group, um, which has information like that as well. So if you, uh, if you were to join the EBSD users group, you'll be invited to join that Slack group as well. So this is why we're here today. Um, electron bath scatter diffraction or EBSD. Now, um, Ali very kindly gave a presentation last year going through a lot of the theory and the more complicated bits and pieces of EBSD. And we're not going to go through all of that today, but we are going to give a quick overview of the, um, the main bits and pieces. So this is a standard um, EBSD setup in, in an SEM chamber. Um, so what we have is uh, a technique to measure um, crystal orientations in the SEM and map phase distributions. And we do this by simply attaching our EBSD camera to the side of the chamber. We have our sample tilted here, and we'll go through a bit later the importance of tilting. Our electron beam hits our sample. We get uh, backscattered electrons that come out of the sample and hit this phosphorus screen on the detector. And this converts uh, the diffracted electrons into light, where we can now see this pattern, and it's collected by the EBSD camera. Um, and then by rastering the electron beam, we can collect a map of information, whether that be phases or crystal orientations or both. Um, this is a list of all of the equipment that we use at the University of Manchester. Now, first, I should mention that all of our equipment is um, uh, produced by Oxford Instruments. So a lot of the software based stuff that we'll be doing today will be based around Oxford Instruments software and their systems. Now we have three different sets of, um, um, of detectors at University of Manchester. We have the uh, older, older CCD cameras. So we've got the Nautilus S and the Nautilus Nano, and these are on our microscopes, such as the Sirian and the Quantus 650. These are high, sensity, uh, high sensitivity detectors, um, and they give good, good high spatial resolution. Um, they have a maximum speed um, of 140 hertz. And when I say this, this means that the rates that they're collecting EBSD patterns, so the maximum here is about 140 uh, patterns per second. And the resolution of this camera is 1344 by 1040. Uh, and then we've got a slightly modified version of the Nordless, which is the Nordless Max 2. Now this is a um, high speed detector, so it sacrifices sensitivity so we can collect patterns much more quickly. And this is quite well suited for in situ experiments. Uh, for example, uh, Jack and I have run um, some experiments on our Nova system, which is equipped with this camera, um, using an in situ heating stage so we can collect patterns quickly as we're increasing and dropping in temperature. Um, and you'll see that the resolution of this camera is much lower uh, and that's to get that speed much higher. 
And now we move on to the new generation of detectors, which are the symmetry uh, detectors. These are CMOS rather than CCD detectors. And these have very high uh, pattern resolution modes and they can achieve amazing speeds over 3000 Hertz, which is really quite incredible. And the resolution these is 1244 by 1024. So it's similar to the Nordless Nano and Nordless S. Um, oops. Right, so this is just a summary of, our, of all the microscopes and EBSD systems we have at the University of Manchester. Uh, we've included the Aztec versions here of the software. So Aztec is uh, Oxford Instruments acquisition software for EBSD. Um, you can see that they're quite varied at the moment, but we're in the process of updating everything to version six when we get our hands on it. So our current latest version we have is on uh, is, is 5.1 or 5.0. Now to note, uh, these are the three different buildings. So we have the M MSS bunkers. All of these microscopes will soon be moved over to um, the MECD building. Um, we have these two in the mill and this equipment in the Photon Science Institute. And you'll notice that we have a lot more symmetries at PSI. Uh, and that's because the equipment here is just uh, much more specialized um, and it's for specific experiments. Um, today we'll be using the thermoscientific um, SEM, and the one we have here is um, specifically designed for high throughput EBSD. Um, I think that's my next slide. There you go. It's just a picture of the chamber that Jack, uh, the, the room that Jack is now sitting in. So this is the Aprio SEM. We've got our symmetry detector bolted to the side here. And we've got two PCs, one for the microscope and one for the uh, Aztec acquisition software. And when we move on to the demonstration, I'll be switching uh, the view between these two PCs on the live stream so everyone can see what we're doing. Um, just to mention why we're using this particular SEM, um, as I said, it's well set up for EBSD, but also we've set this one up for live streaming. Um, so it makes the perfect SEM for this uh, demonstration today. Um, we should also tell you what sample we're using. So, we'll be using a titanium dissimilar weld sample. Now this is effectively two different alloys welded together. Um, so one side we have TIE 64, and then the other side we have this TIE 5553 or TIE 5553. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with titanium, um, in these types of alloys, which are the most commonly used alloys, you'll find two phases present. You'll have the um, cubic beta phase, um, which is shown in this orientation map at the top. And then you have the hexagonal alpha phase um, in between, which is shown in this bottom map, again, an orientation map. Now, the thing to notice is that the beta phase is all one single orientation. And this is useful for us for this demonstration. Uh, the other thing to note is that in the TIE 64, the beta phase is very small. So we've only got about five volume percent here. But in the 553, we have about 50% beta. Now, what becomes important is that because the alpha and the beta phases in this material on uh, the 553, because they're so well interwoven at a nanoscale, this affects how our EBSD patterns behave. But on the TIE 64, we're mostly just scanning the hexagonal phase. So we get much stronger patterns. So the key thing to note is that we get different strengths of patterns and the way it behaves and the electrons interact with the material. Um, and the last thing I want to mention about this sample is that I polished this not very well, and I did it six months ago. So we wanted to use this sample because we didn't want people thinking that we were using, you know, a perfect silicon uh, sample. So that's why we were getting good patterns and really strong signals. We wanted to use something that was a bit more realistic for everyday experiments, just to show that all of these things are possible, even if um, even if the sample isn't the best. Okay, so here is the EBSD setup again. Um, and I'm about to show, uh, flip over to Jack to show you this in the, uh, in the chamber. But this is a different view from what I showed before because I want to point out two very key things here. So we have our sample tilted. Uh, this is our tilt angle here. Um, normally we tilt to 70 degrees, but this is not something you have to use. You can uh, change that and we'll get to that later. But I have two parameters to define here. So one is the working distance, and that is the distance from the pole piece or where your electron source 
and the focal point on the sample. And then we have the detector distance, which is the distance from the focal point to the EBSD camera screen. Um, and one last thing to mention, um, we need to talk about the EBSD pattern center because this has become uh, important uh, throughout this presentation. So the key concepts is that, that we want to convey talking about the pattern center is that it needs to be known accurately for reliable crystal orientation indexing. Um, if your pattern center is not accurate, um, you may have a drop off in indexing of your orientations. So we need the pattern center uh, to be aligned or positioned correctly on the camera screen. And we define the pattern center as the normal on the phosphorus screen, which you can see here. Um, and that is uh, the normal is supposed to hit the focal point on the sample. Um, but what we need to do is define the coordinates in our SEM chamber. So for the um, acquisition coordinates, which in Aztec is defined as CS1, we have the X is the horizontal direction, Y is the vertical direction on your sample, and X comes out of the um, sample onto the pattern uh, center screen. Um, and you can define a separate sample coordinate system as well, which is defined as CS0. You don't have to do this, um, but if you do wish to change these coordinates, you can apply a rotation in Aztec software if you choose to. The pattern center is defined in the acquisition um, coordinate system, CS1. And this means that we have an X coordinate in the horizontal, a Y coordinate in the vertical, and then the Z coordinate is defined as the distance from the pattern center to the focal point. Okay. So now I'm going to hopefully move over to Jack. Okay. So hopefully you can all see the SEM screen here. Yeah, I think that's... Yes. Oh, oh. Now we're on the Aztec. My camera recording has already failed. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I've got a backup, don't worry. Okay. So uh, before we start doing anything, we need to start thinking about where your sample is positioned before you put it in the chamber. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, tips. First is to avoid pre-tilts. Try tilting the stage rather than using a pre-tilted sample holder. So if you have slight misalignment in the rotation of your pre-tilt, uh, for example, in our Quanta 650 system, then you can get distortion and uh, drop enough of indexing. Um, stub extenders are very helpful, uh, which you can see on the screen here, which we've used today. Uh, and this just helps put some distance between the stage and the pole piece to give you a bit more movement in your sample chamber. Um, for multi-stage holders, like you can see here, and this is again, like on our, uh, perhaps the test scan large chamber system, uh, you want to put the sample in the farthest position from the camera to again, avoid the stage hitting the pole piece. Um, and the first thing that I th think we're going to show today, Jack, over to you. Yeah, um, right. So I've already got it set up. As you can see, the detector is inserted. We are at 70 degrees tilt, which is a pretty standard tilt position. Um, I'm working at 20 kV to begin with, uh, which is a good starting point with EBSD. And I am chucking a load of probe current down there. We're at 51 nanoamps partly just to help uh, these patterns zing for kind of showing this off. And um, first of all, I'm going to show kind of centering the diffraction on the uh, camera and the Z height. So we're currently at a working distance of uh, nine millimeters. I don't know if Alec, if you want to show off what's happening on the phosphor screen. Uh, yeah, certainly can, give me two seconds. Go ahead. Cool. I'm just waiting for you to update, which hopefully it will come soon. Yeah. So there we are. That's the uh, live pattern we're getting at the moment. I'm at fairly low magnification. Um, and this is in the single crystal region. So we're getting a very strong pattern. Um, as Alec was saying, we, the pattern center and the diffraction on the screen, you can see the raw diffraction on this screen here. 
and this is the one with various backgrounds and things applied and the pattern is quite high up on the phosphor screen and um, the pattern center which is represented by this green arrow is a bit too close to the top of the phosphor screen for my liking so one of the things that we have to play with is the working distance so to bring that uh, pattern center further down we can increase the working distance uh, these are well tested moves that i'm doing in quick moves don't try this at home do these things in <laughs> slow, careful movements, but I have practiced all of these positions. So we are work going from a working distance of nine millimeters to 13 millimeters. Whoa. And you can see that now the uh, pattern center is far better positioned on the screen and the, yeah, the diffracted signal is far more evenly over the phosphor screen. Um, and we can take this to the other limit. So I'm now going down to 19 millimeters working distance. And now we're in the opposite situation to we were at short working distance. You can see there is a lot more noise over the top of the signal and all the bands are concentrated at the bottom and our pattern center is quite far down. Uh, you may wonder why you would, well, generally if you're doing a single field mapping, you would always try and optimize the position of that diffracted signal. Uh, why you might want to go to 19 millimeters can be demonstrated by going to full screen here. Do you want to just maximize that a second? Yeah. So I'm currently near the top of the sample. Go ahead. Yep. So as you can see in this top left hand quadrant, this is one edge of the sample and you can see our position in the beam. Um, at 19, at a longer working distance, this 19 millimeters working distance, I am able to do EBSD over the entirety of the sample, which I would not be able to do at a shorter working distance. However, as we have already covered, the pattern center is a little bit low. Um, an advantage of these newer symmetry detectors over the um, Nordless detectors is we have another uh, degree of freedom to play with in order for positioning our diffracted signal. It's not just about working distance. I can also, I can also change the height of the detector itself. So currently our pattern center is a little bit low, um, but we can move the detector down. So I'm gonna do this in a series of small steps of two millimeters. And you can see we're getting much better pattern on the phosphor screen. Maybe one more. That's probably a little bit too high, but gives you the idea that we have this extra degree of freedom. Um, so we would now still be able to do the whole sample with our pattern center optimized. Just going to return it to the position it was and go back to one other thing that we have to play with we all get very used to working around at 70 degrees but that isn't it isn't hard and fast with the rules it is a very good kind of compromise position but we can work at a range of tilts so if you watch the diffraction pattern here we're currently at 70 degrees uh tilt if i go to 60 again don't try this at home um <laughs> You can see the, uh, the band contrast lessens. Uh, we're getting less diffracted signal onto the phosphor screen, uh, but it is still very much possible to do EBSD. Uh, these patterns would still be indexed. And much like the, um, uh, the, the previous example, working at a longer working distance, um, I am able to do the entirety of the sample at 60 degrees tilt, nicely gliding past the pole piece. Jack, can you just maximize that quadrant just so we can see it a bit better? Yeah, uh, not that quadrant, that quadrant. So now yeah. at 60 degrees, because the angle of this pole piece is 60 degrees, I'm able to slide past the pole piece. By the way, we're not getting a pattern because Jack is actually scanning now. So we, we only get a pattern when 
if we have the beam in a certain position on it to a single point. Yeah. yeah. Although with this being a single grain, I can be quite high mag in order to get that. Uh, let me just go back to this position here. So here we, that's back at 70 degrees. And likewise, being able to go down to uh, 60, we can increase the tilt. So I'm now gonna take the stage up to 80 degrees tilt. Excellent, I shall maximize this one again. And it continues that the, uh, the amount of signal we're getting has increased. Uh, yeah, so the contrast in the bands has increased. Um, a benefit of working at 80 degrees is that you do have a much shallower depth of interaction, uh, but you do lose a bit of resolution in Y. Um, and as you can probably see from that screen, our freedom to move around the sample is next to non-existent. I would not want to move around due to the risk of hitting into the pole piece. Right. Also, as a, a further note on that, uh, not many SEMs can actually go to 80 degree tilt. Uh, some of them are restricted. So uh, do be aware of the limitations of the stage moving in the microscope you're using. Yep. Um, do we want to talk about the different types of Z and uh, stip tilts? Because we skipped over that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, can do. So on this one, let me just go back to my safe position. Yeah. I'll maximize the SEM screen for this. Yep. Yeah, so um, in the university, we have two main different types of uh, tilt stage. Uh, one where Z will always remain true um, or pure Z. Just trying to think of a way to show that on here, but no. Um, which are uh, like the test scans, the Zeiss instruments, where if you move in Z, your region of interest will always stay the same because you are moving purely up and down. Then a number of our other stages, uh, mainly on the FEI systems, Thermo Fisher, um, the Z is linked to the tilt. So as you tilt, if you move in Z, it will move in and out and you gain a component of Y. Uh, this is that latter type of stage, so you have to be a little bit more careful, a little bit harder for setting up for EBSD. Um, and these newer stages have something called the ZY link um, or compucentric Z, which will move the Y to take account of that shift as you move in Z. Is that mm -hmm. it? Yeah, can you yeah, just guess... show us show us quickly? Uh, just change a couple of positions on there, Jack, just to show. Yeah, I just the want to do that a little it. bit with to be safe. I'm just going to take out the detector a bit. So, so th this is uh, where you know in where we have the microscope where Jack is saying the Z is actually um, on the tilt. So as you ch changing Z, it depends on what tilt you're on. So Where is the, from this yeah. nine degree, nine millimeters working distance down to 19 millimeters working distance, you see it moves back in Y first and then comes down in Z. I'll yep. do the reverse of it now, go back up to nine millimeters working distance, goes up in Z. Oh, that did it simultaneously, so it wasn't so obvious. So back in Y, down in Z, or oh, no, the other way around. Back in Z, down in Y. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and we do, we do just have a list here of all the microscopes. Again, just a summary table to show you which one does which. Um, so it tends to be the the um, these systems here that have the the CompuZ um, functionality, and then it is very much split between the different manufacturers with the other ones. Okay. Um, do we have anything else to add from that, Jack Galley? Or should so. we move on? Uh, yeah, so move on. we need to talk about uh, beam conditions um, for collecting scans. So the two main ones to consider are voltage and current. So if you have a high current and a high voltage, you have a large interaction volume in your material. And what this gives you is a very fast speed because you're getting more backscattered um, electrons. But because of the high of the large interaction volume, you're reducing the resolution you can achieve with your scans. And this is particularly important, like in these titanium two-phase alloys, where you want to get the phase separation of the nanoscale material 
if your current is high and your voltage is high, you're going to struggle to do that. Um, and it's also a case for using lower currents and lower voltages if you have charging or uh, beam sensitive samples. Now, we've got a couple of things to demonstrate um, for the difference that the change in voltage and the change in current causes. Um, and for that, I need both screens. Hold on two seconds while I change things again. Okay. So um, what we'd like to show you is the difference between high voltage and low voltage and the change in the Kikuchi pattern that we get. So hopefully we can- uh, Yeah, no, we'll go, first of all, we'll go for a nice high voltage pattern. I'm gonna go up to 30 kV. It'll take a few seconds. So there is a 30 kV pattern. And now if I'm gonna drop the kV down to 10 kV, Again, take a little while for it to uh, change the accelerating voltage. Now I'm going to try and find that pattern again. Oh, same green, rather, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, well done. Nice. So yeah, so, what what yeah, we have yeah, is yeah. broader broader bands because we've got lower voltage in the current one where it's live on the right hand side so we have lower interaction volume uh, so it gives us better resolution but uh, our signal is lower because we have lower interaction volume but also as our bands are wider so there's if you you can see that it's almost harder to see the bands as sharply as the 30 kb so the indexing won't be as optimal for all uh, for, to give us the orientation but the resolution would be higher. So there's a price for everything. So we gain in resolution, but we lose in signal and also the, um, the ability to index. So 30 kV is a good bet. If you have a large grain size, you don't worry about resolution, you choose 30 kV and you get better indexing. And, and we should also think about those poor, poor people who don't work on lovely metal. Sometimes they <laughs> have to use the low KVs uh, and the lower probe currents, whereas we can get away with 30 KV. Maybe not everyone can. Uh, right, I'm going to get rid of that and yeah. go back to 20 KV, and we'll just do a little bit of a show on the effect that uh, the probe current has. Again, it is a variable for you to play around with, to find out what works best for you. Um, generally, again, so the patterns are looking good again. Um, the uh, probe current, again, with charging samples and things, but also about resolution. You can generally focus a smaller probe current a lot better than you can a large probe current. So in order to show the effect of probe current, I'm going to use what Aztec now calls restore default. On the older versions of Aztec, it's called auto exposure, and I much prefer that term. Admittedly, what it's doing with the CMOS detector um, it is a little different to what it was doing with the CCDs, but also exposure is roughly what it's doing. It will go through a range of uh, different exposure times and find the one that maximizes the signal to noise on the detector. So uh, I'm going to turn up until now, I've had frame averaging on. We'll go over that later, but that's just to make these patterns pop a bit more. Um, so I'm going to hit auto exposure at 51 nanoamps, which again is a lot of probe current, and you wouldn't necessarily always be doing that. But at 51 nanoamps, using the auto exposure, um, I don't know if these numbers have come out particularly large on your screen, uh, but it's come up with an exposure time of 1.77 and the detector feels it can go at around about 560 hertz in these conditions. If I drop the probe current down, and I'm going to go down to from 51 down to 1.6, which is a probe current that is a reasonable, around about a nanoamp is a good starting point on a Nordless Nano, I would say, in the region of kind of one to five nanoamps is usually a good place to start. Yep. So we're now down, yep. The aperture has changed. So I'm going to hit restore default auto exposure uh, one more time. And we've gone from an exposure time of 1.77 to 54.7. And you can see the pattern quality is still very similar 
if not better than what we had at the high flow current, but we are having to expose for that much longer. So yeah, we are now going 18 Hertz opposed to 500 Hertz. I'm just gonna go back up to the mega current one more time to show something else off. So again, we're just changing aperture. Changing so these intensity. numbers are in uh, these numbers are in milliseconds. So one millisecond means thousand patterns per second. Yeah. So, yeah. A thousand captured patterns per second, not necessarily yeah. indexed patterns yeah. per second. Uh, right. So we're back up here. I'm going to restore default. So it's come up with 540 hertz, and that is maximizing the signal across the phosphor screen. And you can see those patterns look nice. The software will have no difficulty indexing those. But the, it isn't a hard and fast rule that uh, just because also exposure has come up with a number, that's the number you have to use. Um, Aztec gives us these buttons above and below the uh, restore default number, this frame time. Uh, and if you click those, it will halve or double the time. So we're at 1.84 and 540 hertz. One click of these. We're now at 0 0.919 milliseconds and 1,000 hertz. And still, the patterns aren't bad. I am pretty sure that Aztec would not struggle to index those patterns if given the right kind of settings. And we could perhaps go even faster. So now, um, oh, we're in speed one mode. So yeah, we've hit our maximum speed. So, so yeah, just, still to, around around. just to say a point that what you're looking at in the right-hand side is the raw pattern and then with ba um, background correction, you get the middle one where it's live, it's enhanced pattern. Uh, this is the enhanced. Yeah, is the one yeah this the is the enhanced. Yeah. More looks like this. Yeah, the same one that's on the front. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, this box also is not, uh, this box can be typed in, so you can uh, decide the exposure time that you want. This is a little bit different on the Nordless detectors. These buttons are still available to you, but they're where we have a kind of infinitely dividable or infinitely settable uh, frame time to a certain degree on the symmetry detectors. On the Nordless detectors, they are far more discrete values. And you should really work for maximizing your exposure time within those kind of set values. Yeah. Uh, and so what Jack shows very really nicely, so restore default, what it does is maximizes the signal onto, on the raw pattern just below the saturation. So the saturation is when it gets so bright that basically we can't see anything. So that's the maximum sort of uh, frame time or exposure time. And then uh, you can drop below that um, sort of really nice uh, uh, intensity on the uh, screen. You can drop, uh, drop below that and it still have a good enough uh, enhanced image for the indexing to happen and get indexing. Yeah. Jack, do you want to just show um, speed two and how if you hit restore default, you can actually make it go a lot faster just by manually entering um, a different exposure time? Yeah, so. So here we, we uh, Jack is just dropping the uh, pixel resolution of the pattern to make the uh, detector faster with speed two. Yeah, so it's come out with 1.84, but I'm pretty sure. And that ran, runs out at 540 hertz, so very similar to the last one. And I can take that down to 0.3, maybe, and be getting over 3,000 hertz. That patterns aren't fantastic, but they are there. So we can potentially run at 3,000 hertz. Right, so do we want to um, go over some of the settings now? Is that Yes. Fun? Um, we're a bit short on time, but we might have to run over a little because of the technical difficulties. Right. Um, so first we need to look at uh, backgrounds um, on our camera image. So uh, one of the defaults that's uh, selected uh, when you open Aztec is the auto background. Um, and that's just what Jack's been showing between the raw patterns and the uh, corrected patterns. Um, so that is, is usually worth doing because it gives you stronger patterns and it helps the software to index um, the patterns, but it does slow your acquisition down. Um, or it can. It can, yeah. Especially if you're going very fast. 
Uh, well, with more binning, essentially. The, um, it, it, in speed two, when you've got more pixels, it, speed one, sorry, and sensitivity, it will slow things down because it's far more processor heavy when you've got a larger image to do it on. Yeah, okay. Um, and the second background we've got is the static background. Um, and this is to help remove um, the uh, things that obstruct the camera getting the patterns. So on most detectors, there's usually a few small bits of dirt on the, on the camera. Yeah, I've just made this bigger to highlight them. You can see a few here, here. And because these are on the camera screen, these are always going to be there. So you can actually collect a static pattern of this to correct for it, um, which you can do during setup. Um, yeah. And you would usually collect around 100 frames. You don't usually need more, more than that. Um, and this will help just clean up, as you can see, those spots have removed. Yeah. Um, um, when setting the static background, try to include as many grain orientations as possible. Oh, so yeah. in, in a large grain material, zoom out as far as you can in order to collect as many orientations because you do not want to get one orientation stuck in the background, which then will be taken away from the patterns and you won't index that orientation. Yeah. yeah. So you don't uh, want to etch a pattern into the background while you're taking it. Yeah. yeah. Um, just the... Uh, a couple of questions have come up while we're discussing these topics. Uh, Kieran asks, does dropping the pixel resolution affect the quality of the BSD map? Um, the pixel resolution if you, uh, of the pattern, if you drop it, then it goes faster. But then if you don't have enough uh, quality of bands, they fail to or have struggled to index the pads because you can't pick the uh, bands. So a higher uh, pixel resolution does give you better indexing, but you lose uh, time, of course. And then uh, David asks uh, if he's, uh, about frame time. So you're going to be talking about frame averaging, right? So we can talk about that a little bit. So he's saying, is, is sacrifice reducing frame time to increase speed is depend on the accuracy of solution required? therefore local misorientation across the grain. So he's talking about if we frame average, I guess, the patterns, what effect that will have. Now we can do that. So here is a nice pattern. Uh, we've got no frame averaging on at the moment. And it's a little trickier for you to see with the refresh rate going on there. Uh, but if we do some frame averaging, I've just gone up to three frame averaging, did that, was that noticeably different? I might have to up it a bit to really show it off. You would never normally go up to 10 frame averaging. I'm just showing the effect that it has in reducing the noise, making the signal, and you can see the difference in the uh, signal to noise ratio, hopefully. Hmm. Down at one, uh, no, it didn't actually change that much. Yeah, so while we're talking um, signal to noise ratio, we should also explain uh, gain. So the gain function amplifies the camera signal before it's converted to a digital signal. So if you've got noise, gain is going to exacerbate it. Um, so you need to take that in consideration when choosing which gain you have. So when you're, when you're using high binning, gain needs to be low. And when low binning is used, gain can be increased. Um, I don't know if we can demonstrate that easily with the- Not easily, rate. but it does allow you to run a bit faster. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, when you increase the frame, uh, if you in decrease the frame time, then you get less signal. Then you may want to use a higher gain, but then you'll get higher noise. So then, if you have a very foot poor pattern, you may want not want to do that. If you have also very small patterns, but a larger patterns, good quality patterns, you can use higher gains if you're using less frame time. If you're using less frame time, your speed goes up, but you lose signal and uh, indexing. Yeah. yeah. So should we move on to the solver as we're yes. running out of time? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so the first thing to look for is the band detection area. Um, so that's it's, over here. It's, it's rare that you'd need to change this, but it's always worth checking when you first open Aztec. Um, because if someone has changed it, it will save where it was last left, even if it's been closed. 
So what you want to do is usually you're going to maximize it and centralize it. So you collect as much of the bands as possible. But say if you had something shadowing, say you've got something in the corner of your detector screen, you want to tell Aztec to ignore that part of the, of the pattern because it's going to interfere with its feature extraction software. Um, so what you would do is just shrink the pattern, uh, the collection region a bit and move it out of the way of that shadowing. But it's usually you won't need to do any of this, but it's worth just checking over it every time um, you, you set up an EBSD. Um, so I've put here in my notes that we should have a quick discussion about um, separating out the exposure time and the frequency of patterns that it's collecting on the previous tab. And then what we're adding by um, processing these patterns and indexing them. So there's always an additional cycle time, which you can see um, just below the pattern detection screen here. It says cycle time analysis. So at the moment we're adding 0.6 milliseconds. So this is always worth considering as well, because we're going to be changing um, how we index the patterns to best optimize speed and accuracy of your indexing. Um, so first, it's probably worth discussing the different acquisition modes, um, which is in the settings tab on the top right. Um, for later versions of Aztec, we have um, different names for things that we did in the older versions. So I'll go through them quickly one by one. Um, optimize band detection, or um, BD, um, which relates to optimize TKD in the older versions of Aztec. This is the best to use in most cases. Um, it has some clever indexing algorithms, and it gives a good compromise between speed and indexing rate. Um, you also have the standard BD and uh, what was called the optimized DBSD. So this has some good uses, which we might go through in some later talks. Um, but the difference is that it can detect, detect the band edges as well as the centers of the bands. Um, and then finally, the last one is refined accuracy. So this does an extra refinement to get a better fit to your patterns. Uh, it's got a really high angular resolution. So this is less than 0.1 degrees. Um, so this is good to use if you, know, you need to be really careful about the orientations that you're detecting. Um, the next setting down is the bands, uh, the number of bands. So this is what you're telling the software to look for, how many bands that you're telling the software to consider when it's solving the, uh, solving the pattern. And again, it's a trade-off of speed and better accuracy. So if you look for less bands, you're using less processing, so it runs faster. Um, but you could potentially get poor indexing, especially in multi-phase materials like uh, titanium here. Uh, if you have more bands, it runs slower, but it's more accurate. Um, but 11 is a good place to start. Now, we've actually got a table here. Hopefully you can still see that. So we've got this band detection guide here. So what you need to be aware of is that by setting Aztec to detect a certain number of bands, it's going to require a certain number of bands to be detected before it will index a pattern. So for example, if we're looking, if we're indexing seven to 11 bands, we've if we've told it to do this number, um, then it has to identify six or more bands before it will find an orientation solution. Um, so you, it's worth noting and need to be careful about that. Um, right, and then the last thing on that tab is a uh, host space resolution. So I won't go into uh, the details of host space, but essentially what you're doing is your the the host space will uh, translation will change the um, inclination and the position of the bands, and then position them as points on a, a two dimensional space, which Jack has just brought up on the left hand side. And your host space resolution um, changes the resolution of this translated pattern. Now the things to be aware of with this is again if you're running high resolution uh, hot space, it's going to slow down your uh, speed. And if you're running lower hot space resolution, you can run faster. Um, but the things to be wary of is you don't need a hot space resolution higher than your pattern resolution. Because the way they convert is that your hot space resolution is half that of the, uh, of the uh, detected pattern. And again, we've got another table just to show. Um, 
So for instance, if you're running uh, on speed two, you've got a 156 by 128 um, resolution of pattern. So 156 divided by two is 77. So you don't need anything higher than that. But actually for speed two running, you know, between 30, just 30 to 40 is fine, but you can go up to 60 or um, it's, it's a case of choosing what's, what's appropriate. But just be aware that if you've got a very low resolution of pattern that you're collecting, you just don't need a higher Hofsprache resolution because you're not adding anything. Uh, I think that's the point to consider there. Um, but if yeah. you want to make the most out of things, you need to be, you know, paying attention to which Hofsprache you're selecting. Do you want to add anything on that, Ali? Yeah, I just want to say that um, what you said was perfectly correct, but just want to add that uh, the Hof resolution shouldn't normally be higher than your pattern resolution. It's just a waste of re uh, um, resources of the computation time. So if you have, for example, 156 uh, pat uh, pattern resolution speed two, uh, your uh, Hof space shouldn't be more than 77 because actually what, what it does is it's, um, it's double that plus one, uh, the actual half resolution that it uses. So, it, um, so anything below 77, but it's even for that, it's too much. So what you said is correct. So to get the best kind of um, uh, speed against resolution, uh, sort of compromise to use something like 30 or 40 for speed two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the final thing that you'll want to do on this tab is to... Um, refine your, your solution. So we've got this little uh, plus button here uh, above the solutions tab. If you select that, this will calibrate the pattern center using the detector distance and the working distance, which are those two parameters that I showed you earlier on the EBSD um, setup. Now, the important thing to remember here is that you need one high resolution pattern for one phase only, because what you're doing is you are uh, more accurately defining your pattern center with the detector distance and working distance. So it's not actually dependent on the phase or the orientation that your beam is currently uh, interacting with. What's important is that you get a strong, uh, reliable pattern to do this on. Um, and that brings us around to what we consider to be the best procedure for pattern optimization in all of these steps. So. Intuitively, you would go through these tabs one by one, but actually it's good to go get up to this stage with a really strong pattern. So we're talking, we wanna go into resolution modes. So we've got a high resolution of pattern that we're detecting. We want a high frame averaging. So we get a really nice pattern. Um, and then we want to get the backgrounds sorted for that as well. So we're giving the computer the best chance of uh, getting the best solution to the EBSD pattern that we have. So Jack's just showing you that now. So he's gone to he's gone to sensitivity mode. Yeah, sensitivity is pretty good for getting a good pattern. It doesn't need to be resolution. Yeah. But we really do struggle in this sample. I said include enough grains. There isn't a position on this sample with <laughs> that doesn't have this prior beta orientation in it. So it does make this a bit tricky to get a good background. Do you want to move to the single phase region quickly? That's not an awful lot better. Oh, isn't it? Ah, oh, shame. <laughs> We're in the single phase region. Oh, are we? Oh, dear. Yeah. So I can collect one, but it's going to have a lot of marks in it from the actual patterns. But yeah, so yeah, we can see probably, oh, yeah, horrible showing. But yeah, anyway, we can get a very nice pattern. Yeah. And then we move along to the optimized solver. So we've got, we've, we're on, we on band detection 11? Um, I have gone to number of bands 12 and the half resolution is actually through the roof. So it's at hundred, but we can see that it is, yeah. Picking things out nicely. Picking the peaks out nicely. Um, yeah. Actually on this system, and since I've been playing with this today, it is very close. So I don't think this is going to make an enormous difference, but then, so we refine based on this position on a very nice pattern. And it's making a slight difference to the uh, detector distance, ever so slight distances, slight distance to the working distance, and we accept it. And what so you're really MAV... looking for here yeah. is for these bands to really snap to what the, your eye can see. Now, unfortunately, 
as a demonstration goes, this is already pretty good. So the calibration <laughs> for this system is better than I've seen on a lot of microscopes. And that just happens to be the case. But I calibrate it and you do see it's snapping to these bands a bit. If I maximize that a bit, uh, I don't know, if I take off the refinement, you can see, especially along this band here, the one, two, bar one, if you can see that's a few millimeters off, and then I apply the solution refinement and it really snaps to those bands. And that's what you're looking for from a good fit. Yeah, correct. And also in, when you're refining, what you're looking for is to bring the MAD down. So mean angular deviation. So it was around 0.2 and when you refined it, it just be, uh, fell below 0.2. So that's yeah. 0.2 degrees. So that shows that it's just, you know, you've refined it and it's managing to accurately index. Yeah. Yeah. So in your, in your setup stage, once you've done this, if you want to run, say you want to run a really fast map, you can now go back to the optimized pattern tab and then select whichever mode you want. Should we say speed two for this? Yeah. Well, let's, let's very quickly with a few minutes remaining, set up a map. So, um, I won't start a new project. I did want to, just to drill into people. When you start a new project, please change the name. <laughs> the number of things I've seen around the university, how many Project Ones there are in existence. Yeah. Please don't <laughs> so, um, At least I have 50, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so as we work, work through, go into specimen geometry. Alec touched on this earlier. So this is where you can put in a specific geometry and it will take 90 away from the Euler angles, add 90 if you know your TD, RD, ND. Personally, I always work with it in 0, 0, 0 and I know my sample. Depending on the work you're doing, you might want to use these. I learned today that um, MTEX, I think, particularly likes this button to be pressed. Um, but at the very least, go on to this page and check that the one you're expecting to be ticked is ticked. Otherwise, your orientations will not make sense to you. Uh, double check the phases are the correct phases that you're looking for. Um, and double check that these tilts look sensible, that somebody hasn't ticked a pre-tilt when you're not using a pre-tilt or vice versa. Uh, take an image. I'm going to collect a force. While you're image. doing that, I'll just say that the sample coordinate systems can be, after you've acquired, can be uh, rotated. The data can be rotated to the different co sample coordinate systems, but the acquisition coordinate system will remain as it is. That won't be touched in the data set, yeah. So we've already optimized the pattern. So I'm now going, yeah, speed two, these look glorious, um, but this is running incredibly slowly. We're gonna get rid of this frame averaging. The restore default auto exposure um, is coming out at 1.6, but I know I can run faster than that. I'm gonna tell it that maybe we could go at 0.3. And again, they look pretty good. I'm going to push the symmetry to what it can do. So go down to 0 0.26, and we're going to be getting around about 3,600 hertz out of it, potentially. Um, the, we don't have a background applied, so I am just going to turn off that. There is a pattern in the background, unfortunately. Let's just collect that. Right. If you if you can't get a static background, just turn that off and use uh, auto background. If, for example, you're looking at really large grains and it's impossible to get a static background. Yeah, now, particularly when they're running in speed something mode, uh, speed two mode, it is coming out with a reasonable MAD, but we are using um, 12 bands still, which is going to take far too long because as Alec was saying it's going to be looking to fit seven bands and that's far more computationally heavy so that will slow down the uh, process. You can see down here that the, the cycle time so the processing the indexing of the pattern is taking longer the the exposure time so you will end up dropping quite a bit of speed so I'm going to go down to 11 bands Ooh, 11 bands and the hot space doesn't need to be nearly that high in fact if it was that high you are oversampling so I'm going to drop it down to let's say 30 I mean I think it still still indexes reasonably our MAD has jumped up a bit but we will get that back in speed 
And then finally, we will go to acquire map data. Unfortunately, the most useful place to, to way to collect this has been moved down here. It's not open as default. Um, we select the region we want to do a map on. I'm going to go over that. Um, we can select a suitable step size. So you don't want too many points across the grain. Um, yeah, so just a couple of notes on this. If you're, if you're, I, the, you want to do something like Jack's doing here and just sample a microstructure and look at the specific details, then a small step size is probably your best bet because you want to get, you want to resolve the morphologies and the features. But if you're trying to collect a texture analysis, then you only need like a few points per grain, but you want to be um, indexing thousands of grains to make sure that you've got a proper texture uh, statistical data set to get it so, correct. It's correct. So typically you want minimum of 10 patterns, 10 uh, pixels across a grain if, if you want to get the more grain size, for example, or morphology of the grains. Uh, but in a texture component, uh, if you get, just want to analyze texture, you don't need that much. Can you also click on settings, please, Jack, there oh, before you start? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So I've started it, but yes, I can. Okay. So there you can also store patterns. So oh, yeah, actually, there. before I say this, because I saw that question pop up. Yeah. So you can store the patterns. Yeah. Uh, one reason why you might not store the patterns, so I'm going to collect over this area again. So this is only a tiny map. It's yeah, it will be completed in, it thinks, 1 minute 37. We'll come back to that. If I say I'm going to store the patterns, and yes, those settings are fine, and I hit start, we will get a warning. And so even though this is a very small map in the grand scheme of things, this will take up 7 gigabytes of memory to store the patterns. And so that's with low-resolution well, patterns. <laughs> Yeah, and these are very low resolution patterns. If you're doing this with high resolution patterns, it is easy to get a single map running into the hundreds of gigabytes. So yes, you can store the patterns and with proper use, please do, but you have to be careful with your data sets and removing them from the Oxford PCs afterwards. Because it's, it's a wonderful way to work, but yes, please uh, manage your data sets very well because what you can do is you can take the data set offline and re-index it as much as you like in your own time, adjusting the settings. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things about uh, just on this collecting your map region. Uh, you should be careful about running long maps um, or anything really cutting slowly, so under sort of 100 um, patterns per second, because um, you're going to end up with significant drift. Um, so maybe not an issue if you're doing a bog texture scan. Um, but if you're trying to do something like we're doing here, then you may end up with a significant amount of drift and you won't be collecting your eBSD map uh, correctly, or at least be aware of what's going to happen. So you can get significant drift below about a quarter micron, but if you're going fast, you can get away with a 50 nanometer uh, step size if you're over, say, 100 pounds per second. Um, but these values are very current and voltage dependent because you're changing you know, the amount of electrons that are interacting with the material and that's gonna change the amount of drift. And do be aware as well that it depends a lot on the material that you're trying to map because some uh, materials charge a lot more than others. Um, and the final thing that I think we should probably show is compare the uh, exposure uh, time and the speed that it's saying that it can collect the patterns, but when you add the processing time, you can see the actual speed that it's collecting with those two things combined here. So we showed that it was uh, it was saying 3,600 to collect the patterns. 3,600, and in fact, we were indexing at 2,942. Still so that, no slouch, but <laughs> not stated speed. And uh, you using what uh, background correction here? Uh, that was with both. Both. So you can get that back if you, for example, switch off the auto background correction there. But yeah, we, that has a, its own risks. You can't do yeah. that at low magnification. You can't That's do right. yeah, So yeah. Yeah. OK. Ali, have you been monitoring questions? Yes, I think we've answered uh, most of them. Um, uh, so you've covered the saving patterns. I mean, we've, I think, uh, David, I think we've covered your frame time. So yes, by increasing the Frame time, you increase the speed, but then you, you, you 
uh, you lose that uh, sort of um, indexing uh, percentage possibly, depending on your uh, pattern quality. Um, so one question has come from Ellie, an extra question is, what is a good MAD? So uh, that's a good question. And uh, it has uh, the software, um, uh, the global limit is 1.3 degrees. So the MAD is the mean angular deviation between the, uh, the angle of the bands that have been uh, detected and the indexed uh, solution. So how far are I, uh, how far is the, um, indexing band, indexed bands to the detected bands. And that's uh, showing the, um, it's shown as MAD. And 1.3 is the global uh, limit, but it depends on your pattern resolution, right? How well can you pick out those bands? And something like um, what, is anything below one degree is very good. And that for high angular resolution, you want to get those down to very low values to 0 0.2, 0 0.1. Uh, by using really high resolution patterns. So if you use refined accuracy, that actually refines the, ind uh, the indexing. So it, you can use a sort of get away by using a half of 50 even with refined accuracy, but then it goes back to the pattern. Uh, and if you're using a high resolution pattern, it slows down the system even more, but you can get uh, below uh, 0.1 degree uh, angular resolution there. So that's how, I hope that answers your question there. Um, there are some materials like copper, Marie asks, uh, like copper, nickel that are quite similar. So I have trouble detecting them separately. Good question. What's there to do? Jack, we're we... gonna be covering in a future talk. That's one yes. of our next topics. That's right. So there's quite a few ways we can do this, Maria. One is using the EDS signal, for example, to separate them. The other one is we have phase separation. So uh, because of the lattice parameter difference, we can pick out the differences. So there's a few ways and we can cover that as a special um, session for that. But EDS is a good way for very similar. If anyone has any um, samples that they want to suggest to, to demonstrate those two particular features, that would be good as well. Just so, because we, you know, we can go away and find some samples that work well for that, but it might be a bit more useful mm if people have something particular that they'd like to demonstrate. If you've got any suggestions, please do. So, uh, Maria, if, uh, yeah, if you have a copper and nickel sample that you want to discriminate between the two, send them to Alec, and uh, if you polish them well, and we can try and cover it for the next session. Um, fan, yes, below one MAD is good, so it's correct. Could you please show page eight in the slides again? Lou, I don't know, Lou asks, I don't know why he wants that but can you show that? Yeah, already on screen. Okay, um, right. I think he wants to get a snapshot of it or something. Uh, he, so Elliot says, yes, thank you, Lou, thank you. Okay, those are the questions. I think uh, we've covered all of them. Um, have we got anything else? I think we've covered Kieran's questions as, as well, I guess, dropping the pixel resolution affects the ABSD quality map quality. So pixel resolution of the pattern will give you higher pixel resolution, gives you high angular resolution, whereas you get slower maps. Whereas if you use smaller patterns, you get faster uh, map indexing, but you lose in angular resolution and quality. Is there anything else? Uh, I think, oh yeah, there's another one here. Josh says, could you please repeat where this recording will be available uh, and perhaps put the link to it? So the, the plan is to, well, first I need to edit out the bit where my computer crashed, um, but then we're planning on maybe putting this on YouTube um, and then the link will be shared around. If not, it will go as a Dropbox link on the Slack site. Um, yeah, I think initially we're going to have it as Slack site. Uh, on yeah. the Slack site, definitely. So please, if you're not a member, become a member so you can have access to it. Uh, Royce have uh, also raised interest, Henry Royce, uh, to house these uh, training videos. So we, before we put it on YouTube, we need to talk to uh, Royce Institute because yeah. they'll probably help us 
to also um, we may get them edited by the uh, e-learning and then uh, put them on ROI. So we will uh, let you know for the future uh, how publicly they'll be available. But if you remember, you can just... Yeah, I think the, the, the raw recording will be fine to just go up on the Slack site, I think. Yeah, can, that fine. should be fine. Um, is there anything else there? Um, okay. Do we have is, a... Sorry, uh, go on, Ali. <laughs> Zuleika asks, is it possible for organic crystals? No, that's a good question. Very good question. Uh, so organic crystals are usually high, um, long range order. And so the pattern and also very small crystals. So, it, uh, and they're also affected by uh, uh, the beam. So getting a pattern from these is difficult. I've not seen one, uh, but it's always, I don't know if Jack and Alec have had experience with these sort of things, ever come across them. I have but not. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, these things, you can see them in uh, possibly in um, uh, TM, patterns from them. But uh, to get any uh, Kikuchi patterns, you need shorter range order. And uh, I have struggled to see uh, any patterns over here from these kind of samples. So uh, if you have a good candidate, maybe it's worth putting it in the microscope and having a look, but usually they are not possible. Kieran says, thanks. Fan, do we have recommended, Fan asks, do we have recommended walking distance and detect the distance for Aprio. I guess that's for Jack. Uh, no. Sorry, Alex, <laughs> well, the, the point is that you 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 don't want to be. So I, if if I'm teaching someone to use the Aprio, I will give them some suggested starting points for working distance and detector distances. But it's different for every sample size, every different scan, uh, different tilts, different currents, different voltages. It's gonna it's always going to change. I think that's the key point to take away. But the thing is, when you're considering these, so for working distance, you always want to be considering where is my sample going to move when I tilt it? Is it going to be near the pole piece? Is it too close if I move it towards the bottom of the sample? And similarly, if it's a lower tilt, is the bottom of the sample going to hit the EBSD detector? These are the things you want to be considering when moving your sample around. So if you've got a very small sample, I would recommend a short working distance. But if you've got a very large sample, then you'll need to use a, a larger working distance to make sure you can move it around. And be adaptive. Look yeah. at the pattern. See that pattern like we did here and go, yeah, you know what? The pattern looks a little bit low. If the pattern looks a little bit low, bring it up. Um, yeah. So, so it's correct. So <laughs> first of all, safety. Make sure you don't yeah. break the system. <laughs> and secondly, what you're looking for, if, for better resolution, you want to shorten the working distance. Shorter the working distance, you get higher resolution and also stability. As you move down, if you have a larger working distance, uh, you get more uh, instability in the beam. So that's what you're looking for. But as you work at a shorter working distance, safety becomes more compromised. Bear that in mind. Okay. Um, is there anything else there? No. So I guess that's that's it. Uh, but generally, I would say to start with, just to finish up, to start with, use basic settings that is comfortable and safe, and then you can experiment going to other settings. Like working distance, anything between 10 and 20 is usually quite good resolution for most samples. But there are more gains to be had through people using the right solver settings, I think, than by playing around with geometries. If you're struggling with your EBSD, I think there is a lot more you can do with both your um, pattern capture settings and your solver settings. So hopefully from this talk, you can go back, look at those slides, play around a little bit with those numbers. There's no risk to the microscope if you change your Hoff resolution or change the number of bands you're looking at. And I almost guarantee that you will see an improvement when you work on those settings. Yeah. Brilliant. Good. I think everyone's, is everyone happy? Are there any other, any other questions? I well, can't it's, see any more questions. It's nearly 20 past three now. So um, yeah. if anyone does have any follow-up questions, please do post them on the Slack site and we'll uh, try and answer them as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, we've currently got another session like this planned for end of October, but that's not confirmed yet. It may get pushed to November. 
depending on uh, how much time you need to prepare it. But we'll we'll keep everyone apprised of, of what's going to happen. Um, Jack, Ali, do you have anything to add? I just want to say thank you to Jack and Alec to make this live session it's so interesting and also you know, set it in, setting it up. I know with a bit of technical difficulty, but <laughs> it's not an easy task, you know, to make sure that we cover the bits that we want with the right equipment and make sure that it works during the day. So thank you for your efforts, Jack and Ali. Thanks, Ali. Okay, well, thanks for everyone uh, for attending and uh, I guess we'll see you soon. Cheers. Cool. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.